landmarks in the evolution of federalism. Understanding the U.S. federal system's evolution from dual federalism to conflicted federalism requires a brief review of the tools the national government uses to expand its authority to direct state and local governments' domestic policies. Although the formal language of the Constitution with regard to the distribution of national and state sovereignty remains essentially as it was in 1791, when the Tenth Amendment was ratified, three amendments, the 14th, 16th, and 17th, have had a tremendous impact on the power relationship between the national and state government. The Civil War, which was a catalyst for the ratification of the 14th Amendment, also influenced the national-state power relationship. The military success of the northern states in 1861 through 1865 in the Civil War meant the preservation of the Union, the United States of America. The ratification of the 13th Amendment in 1865 brought the legal end of slavery in every state. In addition, the 14th Amendment, which was ratified in 1868, which extended the rights of citizens to individuals who were previously enslaved, also placed certain limits and obligations on state governments. The 14th Amendment authorizes the national government to ensure that the state governments follow fair procedures, due process, before taking away a person's life, liberties, or pursuit of happiness, and that the state guarantees all people the same rights, equal protections of the law, to life, liberties, and the pursuit of happiness without discrimination. In addition, the amendment guarantees the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship to all citizens in all states. Accordingly, since the 14th Amendment's ratification, Congresses and Presidents have approved national laws that direct the states to ensure due process and equal protection. This legislation includes, for example, laws mandating that all government buildings, including state and local edifices, provide access to all persons, including individuals with physical disabilities. In addition, the Supreme Court has used the 14th Amendment to justify extending the Bill of Rights limits on national government to state and local governments under incorporation. And in Bush v. Gore 2000, the Supreme Court used the amendment's Equal Protection Clause to end a controversial Florida ballot recount in the 2000 presidential election. Conducting elections is a power reserved for the states. Therefore, state laws detail how citizens will cast their votes and how the state will count them to determine the winners. In the 2000 presidential election, Democratic candidate Al Gore successfully challenged, through Florida's court system, the vote count in that state. The Florida State Supreme Court interpreted Florida election law to require the state to count ballots that it initially did not count. In response, Republican candidate George W. Bush challenged the Florida Supreme Court's findings by appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court. Lawyers for candidate Bush argued that Florida's election law violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause by not ensuring that the state would treat each person's vote equally. The U.S. Supreme Court found in favor of candidate Bush putting an end to the vote count recount called for by the Florida State Supreme Court. Candidate Bush became President Bush. Passage of the 16th Amendment in 1913 powerfully enhanced the ability of the national government to raise money. It guaranteed Congress the authority to collect income taxes from workers and corporations without apportioning those taxes among the states on the basis of population, which had been mandated by the Constitution before this amendment. The national government uses these resources to meet its constitutional responsibilities and to assist state governments in meeting their constitutional responsibilities. Moreover, the national government also uses these resources as leverage over state and local governments, encouraging or coercing them to pursue the implement and implement policies that the national government thinks best. Specifically, by offering state and local governments grant and aids, grants and aid, national officials have gained the power to determine many of the policies these governments approve, finance, and implement. For example, by offering grants to the states for highways, the federal government encouraged each state to establish a legal drinking age of 21 years. Before ratification of the 17th Amendment in 1913, the Constitution called for the state legislatures to select U.S. Senators. By that arrangement, the framers strove to ensure that Congress and the President would take the concerns of state governments into account in national policymaking. Essentially, the original arrangement provided the state legislatures with lobbyists in the national policymaking process who would be accountable to the states. Once ratified, the 17th Amendment shifted the election of U.S. Senators to a system of popular vote by the citizens in a state. With that change, senators were no longer directly accountable to the state legislatures because the latter no longer selected the senators. 
Consequently, state governments lost their direct access to national policymakers. Some scholars of federalism and intergovernmental relations argue that this loss has decreased the influence of state governments in national policymaking. In 1837, the national government shared its revenue surplus with the states in the form of the monetary grants. However, the national government did not make a habit of offering states grants and aid until the Great Depression of the 1930s. Today, federal grants and aid amount to close to 20% of federal annual spending, which covers about 30% of the annual spending by state and local governments. The pervasiveness of intergovernmental transfers of money has led political scientists to study of fiscal federalism. The relationship between the national, state, and local governments that grows out of the grants of money that the national government provides to the state and local governments. If you didn't get the definition for fiscal federalism, make sure you rewind. Historically, the most common type of grant in aid has been the categorical formula grant, a grant of money from the federal government to state and local governments for a narrow purpose as defined by the federal government. Make sure you get that down. The legislation that creates such a grant includes a formula determining how much money is available to each grant recipient. The formula is typically based on factors related to the purpose of the grant, such as the number of people in the state in need of the program's benefits. The Census Bureau collects much of the data used in the grant formulas through the decennial, occurring every 10 years, census, which is mandated by the U.S. Constitution. More than 400 billion grant dollars will be distributed based on the data collected in the 2010 census. Categorical grants come with strings, that is, rules and regulations with which the recipient government must comply. Make sure you get that down, but categorical grants come with strings. One typical condition is a matching funds requirement, which obligates the government receiving the grant to spend some of its own money to match a specified percentage of the grant money provided. Matching funds requirements allow the national government to influence the budget decisions of state and local governments by forcing them to spend some of their own money on a national priority, which may or may not be also a state priority, in order to receive national funding. Since the 1960s, the national government has also offered categorical project grants. Like the categorical formula grants, a categorical project grant covers a narrow purpose or program area. But unlike the formula grant, a project grant does not include a formula specifying how much money a recipient will receive. Make sure you can differentiate those two. Instead, state and local governments interested in receiving such a grant must compete for it by writing proposals detailing what programs they wish to implement and what level of funding they need. The categorical project grant has strings attached to it and typically offers much less funding than a categorical form formula grant. Another type of formula-based intergovernmental transfer of money, the block grant, differs from categorical formula and categorical project grants in that the use of the grant money is less narrowly defined by the national government. Whereas a categorical grant might specify that the money is to be used for a child care program, a block grant gives the recipient government more discretion to determine what program it will be used for within a broad policy area such as assistance to economically needy families with children. When first introduced by the Nixon administration in the 1970s, the block grant also had fewer strings attached to it than the categorical grants. Today, however, the number and the specificity of conditions included in block grants are increasing. So make sure that you can differentiate block grants, categorical project grants, and categorical formula grants. All right, so let's look at the American Recovery and Reinvest Reinvestment Act of 2009. In February 2009, President Obama and the 111th Congress enacted the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA. The goal of this legislation was to stimulate the nation's economy, which was in the depths of what some have called the Great Recession. This legislation included $499 billion, that's with a B, in spending, and $280 billion, with a B, of which we want, went to the state and local governments through grants. Most of the money that was quickly distributed to state and local governments was in the form of categorical formula grants for specific government programs related to health, nutrition, and income security, such as employment, unemployment. Excuse me. Where states had more discretion over the use of grant money, they used it to keep people employed or to create new jobs. For example, state and local governments used the grants to keep teachers and police officers on the job. Moreover, they created jobs in the construction industry by hiring private construction firms to do government construction projects. 
The federal government stimulus money in the form of competitive categorical project grants was distributed more slowly because state and local governments had to prepare proposals that provided funds for energy efficient. Let me back up. Moreover, they created jobs in the construction industry by hiring private construction firms to do government construction projects. The federal government stimulus money in the form of competitive categorical project grants was distributed more slowly because state and local governments had to prepare proposals that made a case for the federal government to fund their projects. Categorical project grants provide funds for energy efficiency programs, broadband access, high-speed rail transportation projects, and educational reforms, to name a few. State and local governments have grown dependent on national financial assistance, and so grants are an essential tool of national power to direct state and local government activity. Although the states welcome federal grant money, they do not welcome the strings attached to the funds. So let's think about whether conservatives or liberals would support what they would support. And also, um, if you think that we should have grown government to the point that we did for um, the stimulus package to go into place. State government opposition to the conditions attached to national grants led to the 1923 case Massachusetts versus Mellon. In this case, the Supreme Court found the conditions of national grants in aid to be constitutional, arguing that grants in aid are voluntary cooperative arrangements. By voluntarily accepting the national grants, the justices ruled the state government agrees to the grant conditions. This 1923 court decision was essential to the proliferation of national grants in subsequent years and to the evolution of federalism and intergovernmental relations as well. But the court's decision did not end states' challenges to grant conditions. In 1987, South Dakota challenged a 1984 national transportation law that penalized states whose legal drinking age was lower than 21 years. The intent of the national law was to decrease driving while intoxicated or DWI car accidents. States with legal drinking ages lower than 21 years would lose 10% of their national grant money for transportation. South Dakota argued that Congress was using grant conditions to put a law into effect that Congress could not achieve through national legislation because the law dealt with a power reserved to the states, determining the legal age for drinking alcoholic beverages. In its decision in South Dakota v. Dole, the court found that the national government could not impose a national drinking age because setting a drinking age is indeed a reserved power of the states. Yet, the court ruled the national government could encourage states to set a drinking age of 21 by threatening to decrease their grants in aid for highway construction. In other words, conditions attached to voluntarily accepting grants in aid are constitutional. Ultimately, the national policy goal of a 21-year-old drinking age was indeed accomplished by 1988 not through a national law, but through a condition attached to national highway funds offered to state governments, funds on which the states are dependent. Over time, the number and specificity of grant conditions have grown. State and local governments have increasingly lobbied national lawmakers during the lawmaking processes that create and reauthorize grants. One goal of this intergovernmental lobbying is to limit the grant conditions, or at least to influence them to the state's advantage. In other words, lobbyists for an individual state work to ensure that the conditions including the grant's formulas benefit that state. Beyond the efforts of lobbyists hired by individual states, coordinated lobbying on behalf of multiple states, municipal governments, and the county governments is common. If a state does not want to comply with a grant condition, then it need not accept the grant. The problem for state and local governments is that they have come to rely on national grant funds. Because the national government has no constitutional obligation to offer grants and aid to state or local governments, the intergovernmental lobbies, is, lobbies persistently lobby Congress to ensure not only favorable grant formulas, but also the survival of grants and aid on which state and local governments depend. They also lobby to prevent the passage of national laws mandating specific state and local actions. Earlier, when we were analyzing the constitutional distribution of sovereignty, we considered specific examples of the court's expansion of national authority through its decisions in cases involving conflicts over constitutional interpretation. The constitutional clauses most often questioned are the Necessary and Proper Clause, the National Supremacy Clause, the General Welfare Clause, the Regulation of Interstate Commerce Clause. With those court decisions in hand, the national government is able to mandate certain state and local government actions. 
In addition, through a process known as preemption, the federal government can take away states and localities' police authority and imposes policy choices on state and local governments. Mandates are clauses in legislation that direct state and local governments to comply with national legislation and national standards. With those court decisions in hand, the national government is able to mandate certain state and local government actions. In addition, through a process known as preemption, the federal government can take away states and localities' policy authority and impose its policy choices on state and local governments. I just repeated that so you made sure you got it. National mandates are clauses in national laws, including grants and aid, that direct state and local governments to do something specified by national government. Many mandates relate to ensuring citizens' civil rights and civil liberties, as is in the case of the mandate in the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, requiring that all government buildings, including those of state and local authorities, be accessible to persons with disabilities. When the national government assumes the entire cost of a mandate, it is a funded mandate. When the state or local government must cover all or some of the costs, it is an unfunded mandate. Make sure you know the difference between those two. Also, common is the federal government's use of preemption. Preemption means that a national policy supersedes a state or local policy because it deals with an enumerated or implied national power. Therefore, people must obey and the states must enforce the national law even if the state or local government has its own law on the matter. The Supreme Court typically has supported the federal government's arguments that the National Supremacy Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause, coupled with the powers delegated to the national government to provide for the general welfare and to regulate interstate commerce, give the federal government the authority to force state and local governments to implement its mandates. The court has also supported the national government's argument that it can attach conditions to the grants and aid it offers state and local governments hence forcing those that voluntarily accept national grants to implement policies established by national lawmakers.